I fundamentally believe that if information is available and if speech is free, that ultimately uh, we will eventually the truth and the right and the good information will win out eventually. Yep. But what that also what I also acknowledge is on the way there, there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of mistakes <laughs> and a lot of learning yeah. and a lot of problems. But I do think ultimately. You know, the way you beat bad information or incorrect information is with truth and good information. You just have to beat it out you by... Put, you just put them right next to each other. Yes. And then people can finally see it. Yes. But, you know, on the way there, there's a lot of crap yeah. that we got we to end up dealing with. Here's the giveaway for today. Maps Anabolic, the program that started it all. It's the one that most people enjoy doing the most, and it's free. Right now, to one of you lucky viewers, here's how you can win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. Do all those things. And if we like your comment, we'll notify you. And you get free access to Maps Anabolic. One more thing. We're running a sale right now on three Maps programs. We've combined Maps Prime, Maps Prime Pro, and Maps Anywhere in a bundle. Normally, would retail for $361. But right now, you can get all of them for $99.99. So that one price right there gets you access to all three programs only in the month of April. So if you're interested, go to mapsapril.com. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Let's be very clear. All exercises have value. The key is in how you apply them. If you use an exercise wrong, terrible value, no value, or can actually cause problems. Use them the right way, tremendous value. All of them? All. Really? Yeah. You know why I, I, I'm i bringing this? It's true, right? Think of now, you can invent an exercise, I guess, that would be bad. But I'm talking about all exercises that exist have been practiced that people do. Mm. There's a reason why they exist. And in the right application for the right person, they're going to have some value. Right. But the values are all very different. And the reason why this is, I, I, I want to talk about this is, you know, today, this morning, I'm working out and I'm trying to work, I'm really trying to focus on lower body stability and mobility for myself. And this is an issue because. I'll do it for a little while and then I get carried away with the strength stuff, which I just love so much. So I'm in the gym and I'm sitting on the abductor machine. So that's the one where you're, <laughs> you're opening your legs, right? And I know we've made fun of that exercise in the past because mainly because people use it for the wrong value. Like they think that, oh, this is going to, you know, shape my butt on the sides or this is more valuable than squats or deadlifts for building my butt and shaping my body, which is not the case Tone my thighs. Yeah, that's why it's that's when it's you're not a big thigh, th thigh toner guy, you know. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> now, time. but to increase master thigh strength and stability with the abductors, especially if your strength and stability laterally is so bad that more functional exercises you tend to have you, you tend to have imbalances like me. Now there's value. So I'm sitting on there doing this, and I'm like, man, if there's any mind pump listeners in here, like, <laughs> like, <why> are, <laughs> you always talk crap about that machine, but dude, now Suzanne and Summer in it all day. Yeah. Right now here. be honest though, there there's a, a part of you though has to believe that there's a little bit of just laziness from you to choose that over doing something that is more functional, like a step up to a balance or do something no, like, like a like no. A, so here's why I'm not do I'm doing that instead of those. Okay. It, because my lateral stability is so imbalanced between right to left and not good. That even something like that, my tendency is to, I, I'll, I'll still be imbalanced and I end up strengthening the imbalance. I noticed this when I was doing lateral drags with the sled. So you need to isolate a little bit more. I have to isolate first, connect and strengthen. And then once I feel like they're balanced, because right now my left to my right is just not great. Then I'm going to go to more functional stuff where, because right now I'm, I'm watching myself. So if you're not balanced uh, right to left and you're doing the machine. They're independent. Are you doing one at a time then? No, but they're one will move independently from the other. So if I push one faster or more than the other, it shows up. Okay. So I'm really, really focused on trying to stay as balanced as possible. And once I feel more stable, then I'm going to move to the more functional. Because I was doing the functional stuff and I was like watching myself. And I'm like, this You're is compensating. It, it's so hard. Yeah. Like I'm almost to the point where I can't not compensate, you know? Well, yeah. So there's no justification for a kipping pull up though. I mean, let's yeah, gymnastics. Just, yeah, I know that's where I was going. Yeah. Actually, yeah. The one <laughs> yeah. application for it is a transitionary move, but just that, that type of stress, uh, you know, in the shoulder joint, yeah. and all the supporting cast and rotator is like, it demolishes it with like high volume. Yeah. And, and it, it just, it's, that's why it's so cringeworthy. I know CrossFit people don't like to hear that because it's, it gives them a lot of numbers for pull-ups and, uh, yeah, <laughs> they've cool. taken, they've taken something and competed with it, which is hilarious to me. Yeah. It's just, I mean, it's just the, the it, most of the time it's, it's a good exercise. that's kind of like 
turned into a cheat for sport. Yeah. I think that's a lot of times where the it loses value because now the intent of it's like completely gone. Yeah, yeah. totally. But if you were a gymnast, I mean, it's absolutely- Very valuable. Yeah. Exactly. You have to learn that. Yeah. yeah, look at the Jefferson curl. I love using that as an example because nine out of 10 people, if you saw someone doing a Jefferson curl, even a lot of fitness people, they would be like, oh my God, what are you doing? You're going to hurt yourself because you're literally with resistance often- totally rounding the back all the way down and then unrounding the back all the way up. And that's like a big no, no, right? No, you got to keep your spine, you know, neutral and stable. That keeps everything safe. But if you have control and stability and you're not moving to the joints and range of motion, but rather what the muscles can control, depending on who's doing it and what they're doing it for a lot of value. I mean, uh, Soviet ever era wrestlers did that exercise quite a bit. And why? Because in Greco, You'll see like uh, the Russian bear, uh, Alexander Carolin used to do this. He would, a guy would flatten out on his stomach. And these are big dudes. These are like 250 pound monsters. And Alexander would scoop them underneath and while he was on his feet in this rounded position, hug them and literally lift them in the air and flip them over and over again and just score tons of points. And he was strong in that rounded position, yeah. you yeah. know, that would look scary for most people. Yeah, totally. So. Well, I think when you position it that way, I think it, you're right. Every exercise can have value. Yeah. The problem is I think that when we see people using these types of movements in the gym, there's so many other things that would be more beneficial. For what that's what they're why, trying to do. That's right? why I asked yeah. you, like, you know, there's got to be a part of you that thinks, you know, well, I'm kind of being lazy because there's, sure. there's a body weight or functional movement I can do to sure. uh, get what, what you're trying to address. And I'm going to get more value as far as like just it being more functional, more calories burned because you're doing your entire body. Yep. So, because yep. I, I mean, I know, I, and I'm aware of it when I do it. There's definitely times when, I choose to use a machine um, for a specific need, but then I also know in the back of my head, there's a better, there's movement. a better movement yeah. I could be doing with free weights. I'm just being lazy right now. Yeah. And I'm, I'm at least working towards dude, something good. Dude, this is embarrassing to admit, but leg swings, like there's no resistance. Yeah. My left leg will not go up as high as my right without massive compensation. So I have to limit the range of motion on my right leg. And then I feel it's like almost impossible to not strengthen this imbalance. So I like hmm. literally had to regress to a freaking abduction machine yeah. and slow down. And like, I'm using the lines of the machine to make sure my body stays in line and do everything as perfect as possible. We got to eat some leotards. Yeah. yeah. Well, I have them underneath my, uh, my okay, workout. I, I well, this that. is where I, I, I think that there's tons of values in the isometrics and doing things like the 90, 90, Bro. doing the totally. 90, doing the 90, 90. I mean, that was, I was so, uh, so different, like my left to right, yeah. um, with what, what you're talking about right now. And, and I know our, my, our good friend, Jordan Shallow loves to tease me about how much I promote the 90, 90, <laughs> but it was, it was such a game changer for me as far as totally. getting, getting connected on both sides, uh, the same, right. Cause it was, there was such a huge discrepancy from left to right that it, I was like, Oh my God, I can't believe Dude. I'm doing bilateral stuff like this. Totally. And, yeah. the, I, and I'm doing isometric stuff too, yeah. uh, for, and I'll tell you what with I and I know I, I, I've seen the literature, obviously we have a, a, a book an ebook now on isometric. So when I put that together, I did a lot of research and the research is mind blowing to the point where I can't believe that it's not one of the most popular forms of training in terms of, of results. Right? So here's an example, isometric contractions result in about 5% more motor, uh, recruitment, uh, motor recruitment. 5%. People think, oh, what's 5%? That is a lot. That's 5% more muscle fibers, 5% more of your CNS firing to do an isometric contraction. That's a big deal, especially when your goal while you're exercising is to recruit the most, uh, you know, yeah. motor, to think get the most motor recruitment. stronger you feel with that 5% yes. help. Yeah. Yes. And then what happens is because you can activate that 5% It would be more, compounding too. You, yes. You would get that 5% and then you'd practice with that and then get another 5%. So or you just go keep... and strengthen it now with your conventional, right. you know, eccentric right. and, and concentric movements. But without that isometric movement, you lost that 5%. You're not going to activate it, you know? So it's, uh, it's pretty wild. Plus, I read another study that showed that it increased tendon stiffness by 40%. This was in a, I believe, a 10-week study. Now, what's tendon stiffness? The ability of your tendon, right, it's to be on, turned on, and to transfer the power generated from the muscle to the bone or to the joint. So you want, and that's a big increase, 40%. That means that your horsepower is sticking to the ground. It's like a car with a lot of horsepower and you figured out how to make the tires so that they stick versus, you know, spin. It's 
transferred, right? Because your strength means nothing unless you can transfer. It means yeah, nothing at all. It's grounded. 40% increase in tendon stiffness from, like, I think it was 10 weeks. That's crazy. I don't know anything well, that can do that. Speaking of increasing yeah. strength, Justin, how are your how are your kids doing, man? How are your I mean, this is now how far how long have we been how long have they been following your programming now? So since January. Okay. So yeah, we've got so a few months here. Um and we're getting into spring ball. So that's the next sort of transition for us. Mm -hmm. Um and what's good is so I, I took him through a whole stability and isometric uh beginning for uh, the first month and then transition them into like more five by five style. Uh, and now we're moving more into hypertrophy. So we're in more of the, you so know, very the, similar to some of the stuff that we've built in symmetry, right? So you, yeah, very similar. Yeah. I bet very, they're having a blast. Yeah. The hypertrophy part. Now are the, the kids hypertrophy fart? <laughs> <laughs> fart. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, man. Protein, you know, yeah. it happens. Um, <laughs> But yeah, they, they obviously enjoy <laughs> it because muscle. they're the ones that, you know, initially I had to kind of stop doing the, the bicep curls and the laterals. Yeah. And like that's all they wanted to do, you know, because they want to look good in the beach or whatever. Now, at, at, at this age, are they are they in tuned enough and are they aware enough at like how much what you're doing is impacting or are right they now i'm sure they are they you think so out. sometimes i feel uh, like at that age you're just like working out is all working out and like you know maybe yeah they're just kind of yeah just, just trust it. my coach yeah. yeah my coach it sounds I like a smart there's guy a lot of trust yeah, yeah i think you're right um i i think it, it, which i take pride in because i know for me um i knew the difference once i had a good coach versus like a, a program that was just totally generic that yeah. i followed uh, in especially in sports, it's it's pretty. It's going to be very evident to them, I think, once they go like somewhere else. after the fact. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I hope, right? Like, I'm <laughs> pretty cocky about that, but hey. Um, but yeah, I think um, it's been a lot of fun to see them slowly, um, you know, transform and get strong, and and I'm seeing some muscle mass starting to increase, uh, and we're now in that position where I'm, I'm going to go test it. And so I'm actually kind of breaking them off into groups, uh, based off of their strength and started a whole leaderboard. Oh. So it's, it's starting to get a little more on the competitive side, but I wanted to wait till they really had the foundation get, to then like get into this. You know, phase. it'll get them like, I mean, these are teenage boys. The second a girl says something like your arms look, Good. Or, wow, you look like you're getting a little bummed. I know. Forget it. It worked for me. Yeah. It worked. Same here, dude. Yeah. I went to school in a, in a tank top, and some girl goes, you got nice shoulders. Forget it, bro. Yeah. That's it. I'm working out every day now. So, how? So okay, you have this leaderboard and stuff like that. Now, are they are they competing against each other? Do you highlight them? I mean, obviously, you're highlighting them on the leaderboard, but, like, what do you do? Yeah, so there's a little bit of that. Uh, for the most part, like I think I mentioned the other time, there's, like, some kids that uh, are doing other sports, and they'll come in just to make sure they're on the board. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Uh, and so they have their names there. It's on the wall. Um, and uh, yeah, it's interesting because there is there is a little more like eyes on what everybody else is doing, which I, I'm glad that's starting to happen because that's kind of like just was innate uh, amongst like the team that I was on. Like when I was like going through the whole thing, I was just like. It's fun. Uh, yeah, I was about it. I'm like, I want to get in the, the strongest group. Uh, were you the strongest in your high school football team or were there other kids that were? So for me, it was, I, they already had all this established what I'm trying to recreate. Um, yeah. and so I found myself first in the skills group. So we had, we had groups based on kind of positioning, which was really smart. Actually, whoever did our programming back then, uh, was actually was ahead of their time, but I jumped from the skills group, which was all like the wide receivers, the quarterbacks, you know, those kind of like fast players mm -hmm. to then the running backs and linebackers. And then I was like looking around and, and the linemen, I'm like, I want to get in that group. And so I actually ended up uh, moving into that group and, and competing amongst like the strongest guys on the team. So why were you in the skills? Cause you were, you were a linebacker for most of your, your football career, right? So why would you be in the skills I, skills group? And not initially I was, they thought they're going to put me at like safety and like, I was going to be more uh, of a DB. Okay. Uh, Cause I was a little on the smaller side. Well, yeah, I was like lean, you know, I wasn't like, <laughs> I was like, you know, kind of skinnier and well, you're um, learning your position, I guess, at that age, aren't that you? too. Yeah. yeah. So I was like a strong safety. And then I kind of moved my way to linebacker just because, yeah. uh, you know, the weight gains and everything else with that. But uh, what's been interesting going back to kind of like 
what uh, I've been having to highlight and address more often now is the nutrition side of it. And uh, really totally. trying so hard to, to implement ways of them increasing their protein because we talk about it all the time. Like if we can reduce it down to a simple focus, yeah, like that would have the most impact. Mm -hmm. And so I keep reiterating ways for them to get it, to incorporate it throughout the day. Uh, and I, I had mentioned I was going to do kind of a reward system for the hardest working kid for that workout. And I was going to bring in like a magic spoon and oh, uh, cool. so are you doing that now? Are you, I started doing that the past couple weeks. They got to love that, bro. It's kid's cereal. It's high in protein. So here's your protein. Well, and, and it's, but even yeah. more point, being highlighted in your peers is the sure. guy who won. I mean, you could probably give them almost anything. I think it's smart that you're using the magic spoon to get your point across with the protein, but I'm sure they enjoy just being highlighted as as the dude for the yeah. workout, right? And they don't want to snack on it in class. Like they they love it. They're just like, <laughs> oh man, give me that. Like they love the uh the honeycomb kind of flavored one. Yeah. That I recently just uh, got. They're they're fighting over that one. So <laughs> I had a kid stay late, help re rack everything, do like an excess of push ups and everything. I'm like, oh psh, all right, dude, here. You know, obviously share. you're the guy today. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like you're my guy. I wish because I have a dairy intolerance, which annoys me because I have have you guys ever read the studies on the health benefits of whey protein? So it's obviously, you know, well known as being one of the best types of proteins because the amino acid profile is so good. And, you know, it's got it's shown, you know, if if protein is not at the high limits, then it makes a big difference to have whey because it helps build muscle and all that stuff. But there's health benefits, there's tremendous health benefits for, from well whey protein. People with irritable bowel syndrome who don't have a, a dairy issue, whey protein is beneficial for the gut. It lowers blood pressure. It's been shown to lower blood pressure. Oh, wow. It's good for diabetics. It's one of the most satiating proteins. In other words, there's studies on weight loss show that people, when they increase their whey protein intake, lose weight because it kills appetite. Now, is this just protein in general or is this whey, whey, whey compared, to others? compared to others? Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Now, now, we know that if protein's high, then the amount, the where it's coming from doesn't make that big of a difference. But most people don't eat a gram of protein per pound of body weight. So when you take the average person and have them supplement with whey protein, these studies show like all these incredible benefits. But whey's high in branched amino acids, high in glutamine. It's got peptides in it that have other uh, like immune boosting effects, which is why you see this with irritable bowel, irritable bowel syndrome, which is annoying to me because I can't have whey. I wish I could yeah, because it's such a good source of protein. You know, speaking of sports, I've been, I was uh, there was an article that I was reading about sports and the- what? Right, not accident. No, <laughs> wait a minute. I didn't look outside if pigs were flying around. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> right, it's sorry, the, go ahead. I like the psychology and surrounding sure, why, sure, that's why, why that's, humans, yeah. Because if you think about it, the vast majority, like if you look at if you think of everybody that plays sports right now, everybody 90 something percent don't do it for money or a trophy or anything, they're just doing it for they're just doing it for themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Most yeah. people play any sport. For what reason? And and if you really break it down, the human psychology, it's like, we're going to create these rules that we're all going to agree upon. We're going to score points. We're going to struggle, increase our risk of injury. It's going to be hard and sweaty and painful. And we do it because it feels good. And this highlights the human need for struggle and challenge. Yeah. That's the whole reason why we do this kind of shit. Yeah. We need to have struggle and challenge in order to feel alive. And sports is such a great example of that. Because again, yeah. most people don't do it for anything. You're not winning anything. In fact, studies show that when you take athletes that play sports because of the passion of, and the love of it, and you pay them, they start to lose their desire to play mm. the sport. They actually start to lose I imagine that would be one of the hardest things uh, as far as being a professional athlete, right? Because you work most of your life to reach that level mm -hmm. and then getting that big contract. Well, I mean, we now see- a job. By the way, we see this examples all the time in professional sports. Whenever you- So uh, we used to play a lot of fantasy football and I always would draft a player Is that, that was on- you dress a, up like your favorite character? No, no. <laughs> <Are> you, <laughs> oh, that's different? So, do you know how fantasy works? <laughs> it's like yes. a LARP. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you get in position, you know? <laughs> I'm Steve Young. Yeah. No, I mean, this actually really <laughs> this highlights fullback. your your point though that you're making is that you know so the I always would draft players that were on contract years oh. because they they don't have the money yet they're trying to get the yeah. money and they have they ball out it's always like one of their best years they have yeah. when they're trying to, and then they get that contract and many of them just start to decline in their performance not yeah, all but a lot of yeah. them do well, they once show, they there, make that payday there's an actual it's a documented psychological phenomena that when you do something for the sheer joy of it whether it's writing or 
playing a sport or working out or anything, and then you get paid for it, yeah. that some of the joy gets now, uh, reduced. I would you, disagree with that with us. I mean, we weren't getting paid when we first started. There was tons of joy, but I have more joy today than I did then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it the feels, joy is It feels increased. really good to do this and actually make yeah. money doing it than it did the first year when we sure. weren't making any money doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But, I, but, I, I, but I understand. So it doesn't apply to all cases. No, all no, saying. no. But generally speaking, like, I get it. Like, like I don't know. Is there something that you do on your own now that you really, really love that's not a, a, you know, a job for you? Like, if I started getting paid to work out, uh, I mean, it would be cool, but I could see how then it would become more of a job. Well, no, that's how I felt that way about competing. I was doing, go, I, I was competing for like this, right? To build, help yeah. us build this. And then once that was done, uh, like it made me really like for, uh, I'd say the last year, two years after. Not after enjoy it. Yeah. I was wow. kind of like, I almost wanted to go to the other extreme. Now I would have never gone the complete other stream and stop working out, mm -hmm. but I really pulled back and just like, I, I don't. I don't have the same love and passion for training at that level because, uh, in, except for to have built what we did. And then once that was done, it was kind of like, eh. Yeah, I'm, it's interesting because I've, I've seen like some players that I grew up with and uh, they got scholarships and like full rides. And um, I think there, there was an element there of being the best and not really having any hmm. Anyone like super close to that talent level, and then all of a sudden being the small fish in in a in a huge pond, whereas like everybody is just as good, if not better, than you, uh, and you really have to like reprove yourself. Like they, they fell off, yeah. and that was so frustrating to me because I'm like, give me that, like I want that opportunity to <laughs> prove myself, mm. and it was interesting to see how like there was a clear divide of what type of athlete rose to that new occasion, that new level, and, and one that was like, well, forget it. I just want to stop at being the best. Well, yeah. it says it's called the overjustification effect, which reduces intrinsic motivation. It's interesting. It's very interesting, right? Like yeah. like people, they, they like uh, you look at like top uh, Olympic athletes, when you're at that level, you, you probably started because you had this crazy passion for whatever yeah, you're yeah. doing. So it's not like you started as a kid thinking, I'm going to do this for the Olympics. You're like, I love swimming or whatever. Then you're talented for it, and then because it's coming combined with your love for it, and you're competitive and disciplined, then you reach that super high level, and then it's like they stop; they don't mm -hmm. want to do it anymore. Yeah, you know, like I don't really have a desire. What's or, that, the? Why's that saying go? The the wolf climbing the hill is always hungrier than the wolf on top of the hill, yeah. or whatever. Yeah, but when he wants the food, it's there. That's yeah. from uh, Puppy. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's, that's, that's Puppy. I said that. <laughs> Pretty funny. Always bringing it back to Arnold. I, he's so much wisdom. All right, yeah. I uh, I got I got some interesting uh, studies on grip strength. So this is an interesting one. So there was a, a huge study done on five thousand people on grip strength. Check just grip strength. Men with a stronger grip, check this out. They have better cardiovascular health. They score better on intelligence tests. They have better overall mental functioning, generally more athletic, are more socially aggressive and dominant in a positive way, often relating to having more financial success and are more likely to age well, all off of grip. Now, yeah, but couldn't you say that's all connected to working out? Right, all Just those overall all, fitness. Yeah, of course. Because all those things are, are improved with working out. And yes. most likely, the, the men that have stronger grip are the ones that are working out and They're, not working out. Now, it's here's, a, it's here, a display of health, right? Like, yes. Uh, yeah, your grip strength is an indication of how well things are going. It's a very easy one. Because yeah. there's like there's other ways you can indicate strength, but grip is so easy to test. And it's like, this will tell you right away. Well, I and remember when, this, we, it, when we hung out with Smitty and Joe DeFranco, I thought that when he brought that, the, the yeah. whole grip strength idea oh, yeah. for I've testing your clients. I love that. I, it's, like, there, it's been a while since like another trainer like blew my mind oh, about something. And I'm like, those guys are the best. How did I not like think of this to do this well, with my client? I wish I had thought of that you, and used that as a tool. You know what it is? It's because yeah. they, they coach and train people all the time. The yeah. problem with HRV testing, it, it's great metrics, but what a pain in the ass. It's like yeah. such a complicated measure this, measure the variance between your heart rate. You got to do this when you wake up, you got to whatever. If you're when you're a trainer and you can find a way to do something and make it easy as hell, yeah, it's like that's like a, a game changer, and that was a total game changer. Yeah. Instead of measuring everything, just test your grip. Yeah, in this particular study too, they found that men with a strong grip are far more likely to marry, and then when they and then <laughs> along those lines, women uh, find strong, firm hands and grips to be one of the most attractive traits and that's like old wisdom right what are they yeah. what, what would you learn with the handshake Wait, right? yes the limp wrist oh man i think that goes the other extreme though sometimes too there's like i feel like i've 
shook the hand of, of insecure guys that feel they oh, need, when it's they obvious, need oh, like yeah. overcompensate. Yeah, there's a difference between like a good firm it, handshake yeah. from someone and you're like, oh, that dude's solid versus like, whoa, bro. Yeah, are you, yeah. Wait, are you, yeah, we're you trying to crush me. Yeah, oh, no. like where you're like trying to do that. Like you, you've met people like that, right? Where they kind of you know what like I do to them? rip you intentionally. You, you know? know what I do? Because I, I tickle them. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> you do the weird. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah give them the, thumb, the finger dude. drag. <laughs> the, the, the no thumb's my favorite because you're going yeah. Uh, oh, and it's, it's like they're grabbing a flipper. It's, it's, it's fucking so weird. weird. It's so weird. No thumb, you guy. No thumb, no, that guy. No, I. So grip strength happens to be one of my 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 biggest strengths. So whenever someone used to do that to me. I would, when they come in, you could tell they're like insecure because I'm like, ah, I would crush the fuck out of them. <laughs> so my sister actually, when my sister, my old, my, not my old, she's the oldest girl in my family. So she's second to me. When she started dating and I'm very overprotective, right? So these guys would come over and they'd be all, and she'd warn them. My brother is really overprotective. Yeah. And this one dude, I remember, I'll never forget. He comes in and he's a, he was a douche, total douche. I forgot his name. Cause if I knew his name, I'd call him out right now. Cause I still Johnny hate the guy, douche. <laughs> but he shows up total douchebag. I could tell right away, walks up and he goes and he shakes my hand and he's like, he has his elbow up and does the whole like this. Oh, the elbow up guy. Yeah. yeah, yeah okay. And I pulverized his hand. Like I literally, I held it and I just fucking <laughs> dropped it to his knee. I mashed it and uh, to the point where he made this with his face. Like, <laughs> yeah, I made a mistake. And my sister was like, Sal. And I let go. And then he didn't say nothing else. Were you, like, that. Were you like just crush the fingers into them? Oh, I felt like, his, I felt his bones shift, you know? You yeah. Feel like bones just start, you feel a knuckle really dig in. You're like, yeah. yeah. I'm like, here you go, buddy. All right. Anyway. So um, I know we're recording this episode a little early, so news may change or whatever. But I want to comment on the the, the stir. That just we don't have to go into specifics, but Elon Musk is just created so much stir and buzz around yes. everything. It's exciting. Speech it's exciting. wise. Some are calling this the biggest tech story of the entire year. The world's richest man worth an estimated two hundred sixty billion dollars says he wants to buy Twitter. You made an offer to buy Twitter. Uh, take a look at this. Elon Musk agreed with a tweet saying that the, quote, game is rigged, unquote, if he cannot buy Twitter. Just like shaking it out. The people who are a a afraid of him or opposed to I was him just gonna are say, so hypocritical. I was just going to so so ask you, what is it about, you know, and I have a friend that is too. I sent over a, a text about some of the stuff he's doing and he's just kind of like, oh, I don't, you know, whatever about him. I'm like, dude, how does it, how does what he's doing not excites you or how are you not intrigued by it and how do you and why are there why are there groups of people that don't like him like what is it that they don't like about him i haven't been able to like because it's politicized is because, it where because i thought yeah. i heard how did he come up with it how did he get his money did he inherit it well, he like did paypal was, was, was one of those no no, no, no that's how he got himself but before that like did he he comes from money right not really no i think he got a small start by the way so then what is it people need to realize something right now if i gave I mean, yeah, yeah if, if i, I gave, gave you a hundred million dollars i could i could pick you could give me a, a hundred thousand people all of them a hundred million dollars not one of them would turn it into a billion dollars that's how hard it is to go from a hundred million to a billion so people who see, see billionaires lottery winners yeah people who see billionaires who go oh well he got a million dollar loan from his like do you know what it takes to go from a million to a billion it's harder to go from that than zero to a million yeah that's that's a hundred percent fact so i have to read i was gonna read this uh, comparison just from like one uh, publication it was business insider oh they so they did one tweet uh, uh and this was um 2013 this was it says billionaire jeff bezos washington post by marks of fascinating cultural transition yep. in america yeah bezos right? buys same washington. exact publication business insider now with elon musk elon musk attempt to attempt to buy twitter represents a chilling new threat billionaire trolls taking over social media it's so crazy like you completely just create a, a look, total look different narrative based on your own it's so, opinion you that's, know bill, that's the part that annoys bill maher gets into that with rogan just talking about that how crazy slanted you know they're just like Such two decades hypocrites. ago you know your late night guys wouldn't even talk politics like they you wouldn't even know what leno or letterman or what these it was are. the third rail yeah and yeah and they just stayed away from it, it they was didn't refreshing want refreshing because it's just entertainment and you didn't want to divide your audience there was no reason to do that you know and leave your political beliefs at home but now if it, it feels like it, and this is coming from by the way bill maher who's like a left-leaning guy anyway saying like it's like you are on and i that, think it's going to go back I think it's going to go back to our time. You know why? Because, I definitely believe that. Because p companies are getting crushed. Yeah. Because first As off- As they should. Let's well, get politics out of all this stuff, Because dude. if you make a strong position, you better be perfect in your past. And yeah. let me tell you something. There's very few companies that are perfect in their in their application 
of their opinions or their beliefs. Like, for example, people so like, oh my God, Elon's going to buy Twitter. We're so uh, scared or whatever. They don't care that the Saudi kingdom is one of the major shareholders, uh, that BlackRock is one of the major, or was one of the major shareholders, or Vanguard, mm -hmm. uh, or they don't care that China owns TikTok, which is a much larger, more popular platform than Twitter, and China does a lot of crazy, a lot of terrible stuff that people here wouldn't stand for. So shut your mouth. They're so It's so strange. It's so strange <laughs> to me. But they don't like Elon. You know why? Because... He's become politicized. First of all, he was targeted by uh, Elizabeth Warren. Love target. He's the richest man in the world, so he's already target. She targets him, saying billionaires need to pay more taxes, even though the guy's paid more tax than anybody in, in history. <laughs> um, and he's created so much and innovated, but he's been targeted and politicized. So that's why. So people who are on one side now look at him as a politician, yeah. not as a guy that does a good job so people give him money because they like what he does. Yeah. You know, so it's... it's I mean, I feel like weird. you can totally disagree with someone's uh, political beliefs at that level. Let's, you know, take a Bezos and Musk as an example, but still also respect what they have done for our, our economy. Right. Like what the, the innovation that the, those guys have both done, the amount of jobs that they have created for people, you know how many, you know... Well, I just get excited when he does anything because he will do it. He's a man of action. You know, it's like he'll say something and then he'll build it. Like he knows how to execute. Whereas a lot of people say things, politicians say things all day long. Where is it? Where is all of these yeah. wonderful things that you've been promising everybody? Nowhere. It's not anywhere. Yeah. Like there's rare. Do you find somebody that can actually build something and see it all the way well, through? Well, people get confused where wealth comes from. What they think is that wealth, that there's this fixed pie of wealth. And if you have more, that means everyone else has less. But the truth is we create, like America today is more wealthy, even if you were to, to reduce the population per person is more wealthy than, than 100 years ago, 50 years ago, or than 20 years ago because of efficiencies. We're more efficient at what we do. So like Amazon- That's like the same thing where people get scared about like AI coming in yes. and put, replacing everyone's jobs. Like I was just in a debate with my buddy about that too. Like, oh man, the AI is going to put everybody out of work. It's like, it doesn't work like that. It's going to change the jobs. Yeah. Just like 50, there's so many jobs 50 years ago that mm -hmm. don't exist today because of efficiency, right? We've increased efficiency. So if you look at Amazon, the obvious thing is like, well, Amazon employs 100,000 people. Okay. Well, yeah, that's obvious. Yeah. You know, Amazon, uh, you know, allows businesses to, to grow now. Okay. Well, that's maybe not so obvious, but look at all the downstream efficiencies that Amazon has created. It's almost impossible to quantify how much it's added to the quality of life and to the wealth overall. And it's not just the jobs uh, that they create. There's so much more that's there. For example, like the innovations that uh, Tesla has made is probably done more for climate change than public policy has. Just just his innovations, right? Yeah. Uh, just like the um, like zip drive, like you know how many trees were saved because of the zip drive mm -hmm. more than like these organizations that try to save trees yeah, all the time. Go paperless. Yeah, exactly. Became a thing. Yeah. Something. Yeah. It's all. That's all stuff to consider. No. Just kind of interesting. Yeah. All right. So let's go back to science a little bit. Let's talk about melatonin for a second. I didn't know this, but melatonin has a strong effect on growth hormone. Did you guys know that? Mm. If your melatonin is low, let's say you have poor sleep. Um, and growth hormone shoots up? No, growth hormone is lower. It's blunted. It's blunted, right? And growth hormone is obviously partially responsible for muscle growth, fat loss, skin, right? It's like the, the youth That's hormone. interesting because I, I would think the opposite. I think your body would think to go into like fight or flight type of situation and then that would get a natural uh, boost because of that. No, growth hormone. Yeah, growth hormone can go up from... Uh, when it comes to fasting, but if you do it for too long, it goes right down, right? right? But when it comes to melatonin, low melatonin can also mean low growth hormone. So it's inversely related to cortisol. Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Well, well, directly growth hormone and insulin are inversely. When right. one is high, the other one goes down. So if you spike insulin, growth grows, hormone goes down. If insulin's low, growth hormone tends to go up. But with melatonin, they've done studies where people will supplement. Mm -hmm. with melatonin and you see an increase in growth hormone or for example um, wearing blue light blocking glasses increases the production of melatonin in most people which is good because that, that's a naturally what your body's producing yes. versus like exogenously yes i know a lot of people that do supplement with melatonin a lot but uh, i would always assume it's better to produce it naturally. yeah supplementing with melatonin is like a it's like a second rate, it's a substitute, right? For what you could do naturally. 
if you get good sleep, you don't expose yourself to too much blue light or you block it with blue light blocking glasses. If you don't eat too close to bed, you know, all the stuff we know to make yourself sleep better. Yeah. You're going to get more melatonin production. You'll get more, you know, REM sleep. You'll dream more. So how, and how that results in more growth hormone. So how, how adverse could it be for somebody who consistently uses melatonin like every single night? Uh, I know people that do that. Yeah, they do. Well, your body, there's a, there may be a negative feedback loop. So where your body will stop producing as much of its own melatonin. Now you're replacing so yeah. yeah, but then how would that affect growth hormones? What I'm saying, would that I don't know. That's hormone? a good question. I don't yeah. know if replacing melatonin exogenously, if that's a perfect replacement, or if there's other downstream effects. That's that's a good question. Because you would think your body would downregulate how much it's producing, which then I would think would inversely affect. The yeah, but then you because you're supplementing with melatonin, your body's still getting the signal hmm. and will reproduce, uh, you know, more growth hormone. Hmm. Um, so and, you know, it's funny with this particular. Science. What, what are sorry, sorry, but you just I want to. No wanna, problem. Uh, what are some of the things that that we can do naturally to to boost that? So oh, like anything that improves your sleep, rhythms, right? Yes, anything that improves your sleep. So get sunlight during the day for the circadian rhythm. Don't eat too close to bedtime. Cool room, dark room, blue light blocking glasses, or no electronics a couple hours before bed. Like all these things, anything that will make you improve the quality of your sleep improves melatonin production. Mm -hmm. And so they're finding there's a lot of melatonin deficiencies going on as a result. By the way, low melatonin, really bad for the brain. Really, really bad uh, for the brain. So hmm. yeah, it's really, really interesting. So, But I, like I said, the study showed in people who had poor sleep, blue light blocking glasses had a significant increase in melatonin production. And you know, I know when I wear Felix Grays, I tend I sleep deeper and I'll have more dreams when I yeah. do it that way. Do we yeah, know how long sure. it takes to reverse that? Like if someone has really poor sleep and poor production by doing that, like is it something that you can do instantly and feel the difference or is it something I need to consistently do for I think weeks you see or months? I think you see an instant result. Um, I'm trying to remember. I think you do see an instant result. I'm almost positive you do, but then over time it gets better. So it's like you'll have better sleep and then do it again. You get even better sleep. and Just like when oh, you're- so compounds. Yeah, yeah, just like mm -hmm. when you're trying to you know improve the- the quality of your sleep. So really interesting stuff uh, in regards to blue light blocking glasses and, and melatonin. And it's an important neuro hormone. Oh, you brought up Tesla. The, uh, so uh, the self-driving car thing uh, is kind of getting interesting and funny at the same time. So um, did you guys see there's this video circulating? I think it was in New York where a self-driving car that obviously doesn't have anybody at the wheel uh, was pulled over by the cops. What? Yeah. So uh, apparently, how do they pull it over? Uh, they just I did they turn get their lights on and went behind it, you know, <laughs> yeah. like they would normally. And it, yeah. I guess, it stopped. And um, they went to how confusing for the police officer. It's so confusing. <laughs> Who do I give the they, ticket to? Well, he went in, looked in, and was like, "There's nobody in there." And then they were kind of discussing, and then it took off. And so it. <laughs> <laughs> it really ran away from the cops through the next like intersections. What? And uh, I don't know, obviously some glitch and they haven't figured all the logistics out, uh, I guess, with the whole like police, like pulling them over and everything. But I thought that was pretty funny. Like at least that that's, uh, that's something that's now we're have to kind of figure who's, out. Whose self-driving car was it? Who's it connected to? Do we know? Uh, you know, I don't know. I saw, I was trying to figure that out too. It was like a Google one. It was right. like a mapping one. It looked like to me. Uh, one of those who's that, who's in the lead of this do you guys know who that we I haven't checked back in on like to see who's leading the way right now in self-driving cars well, i know google's got the you ever seen them driving around with the they have like that like weird yeah that's, that's what it google, looked like it was, it was either that or apple has those too obviously because they have to you know maintain their maps or ways i'm yeah. sure has it too so it could have been any one of those now, i thought do you know laws, who leads the way doug i have no idea yeah I remember, did you watch uh, Super Pumped? Yeah, The yeah. story about Travis so Kalanick good. Very, and very uh, Uber. Okay. That's yeah. right. Uber's been trying to work on that. So they too. basically got the the tech guys from Google, and uh, there was a big lawsuit you know, between them yeah. because of that. I, I, I thought there were laws that said a self-driving car still has to have in a, like a human passenger. Yeah. Is that, isn't that a law or am I tripping? Or is that only depending on what state or city? Yeah, it must depend on, yeah. The, I, I don't know, but if you guys had state. to speculate on who you think uh, gets there first, who do you think gets there first? Tesla's already... I like Uber as Uber being one of the first to get there. Well, I think delivery cars will be first to do it, whatever that is. So I know Domino's has a pizza... Which one's the Noid? Well, okay. Avoid the yeah, noise, yeah, the Domino's. Domino's. yeah, I know that you They've could call there. Domino's and a, a van, they were testing it, like a truck pulls yeah, up. Yeah, I so it depends on what up. angle you're talking about, right? Because if it's 
if it's the angle where it drives up and picks you up and takes you somewhere, I say Uber. Obviously, mm, that's if what it's I the think. delivery. I would think, um, you know, I, I feel like Apple regulations. Google, Google. I feel like regulations would be easier with delivery than it would be with human passengers. Of you know course, I mean? of course. You yeah, know? you'd easily you'd get away with delivering a pizza than a human a yeah. lot easier. I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a lot less risk. You know, human delivery Fucked service. Up pizza, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I need a, I need a, I need a gardener. Speaking of which, uh, what's up with this weed whacker thing that you bought? You, I heard you talking about it. I want to hear the yeah. story. Yeah, so I I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but I, if, I, I mean, I hate to say maybe it's inflation, whatever it is, right? But like everything's gone up insane amount yes. of cost. Wise. Like you're trying to get things done around the house. It's like it costs you an arm and a leg. And I, don't, I just got frustrated with it. I'm like, dude, forget this. Like I'm just going to go get my own weed whacker. You know, and uh, so I, <laughs> I was like trying to, um, I was basically trying to like go through my backyard and realize it got way out of control. It was like a jungle back there. And there's like, because I'm in like my backyard, it has like a lot further down than I realized. Like I did, I'm not even halfway through yet, dude. I'm just out there whacking weeds. <laughs> Like it's, but I like it. It's, it's Zen. It's like some, I don't know. There's some kind of like meditative quality to like manual labor. Sometimes. Especially when it's repetitive like that. And it almost is mindless. You, I don't have to think like nobody's gets, gets out of the house. Me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's my new thing. Instead of washing yeah. dishes. I love it. Like I love like, are you, you got headphones going on? Or are you, are Hell you, yeah. Just, yeah, 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 yeah. Headphones. Like you walk I, in and wife's, I, like, you know, wife's, like, goggles, I to, like, wife's like, I need to talk to you. Uh, hold on a second. Hold on, so I'm I not got, done yet. What was that? Or yeah, go ahead. Tell me. (laughs) Just nodding your head. Drowned out everything. It's like white noise. That's like manly. This is why. This is why guys fix shit outside. (laughs) Yes, I figured it out. I'm like, this is why. Like, that's funny that you felt that way because I feel the same way right now. Because we just we just had somebody do uh, our backyard like pulling weeds, and it's we our whole backyard sand. So like pulling weeds from sand is pretty easy. And the the quote we got was ridiculous. And then we just. We just called somebody yesterday. I, I had Jerry call someone to get um, the sauna, right? So we have a sauna in the studio, and we're getting ready to get the cold plunge brought in. And so I, we need to rotate it. It's literally like a if you have the tools, if you have the dollies to do it, it's literally a, a five minute job. Yeah. yeah. And someone quoted us like five hundred dollars to do it. I'm like five hundred dollars is crazy. Like yeah, get out of here with that. About? We could go buy all the equipment for half that and do it ourselves. So, so yeah. So she looked up, but I I, I feel the same way too, Justin. I feel like because of this. Everybody is like uh, opportunity to increase my my because like that like that job doesn't didn't get any more difficult because of inflation. No, like, uh, other than maybe the gas it takes them to drive no, here. It's that so money lost its value. Yeah, that's exactly. Have you seen the inflation charts on like I know they say it's eight point five percent, but when you look at like this year gas forty nine percent, used cars twenty five percent, like everything is like bacon, chicken, beef, like double digits in in price. That literally, you know what that means? People may not realize this. If if your favorite if you buy all this stuff and it averages out to let's say twenty five percent more expensive, and you have a hundred dollars in the bank, it's now worth seventy five bucks. Like you, for, that's it. You lost twenty five bucks. So you get a raise at work. Like yay, you know I got you know a ten percent raise. Well, that's nice. I'm still down fifteen percent based off of the shit that I I buy. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Oh wow, it's Doug crazy. pulled it up. Waymo, which is uh, owned oh, by Waymo. Google, right? So they Google owns them. Yeah, Alphabet is Google. Yeah. Right. So Google owns them. They are the leaders, and they're, they're the ones to beat. So since 2009. Because huh? of all Google Earth stuff. Sure. Yeah. Sure, mm-hmm. that makes sense. Have you uh, – What was there was a movie I saw once where they were trying to get in front of the Google car because it was passing by their house, and they wanted to make sure that they were on Google Maps. So they, uh, like, stood in front of the house. Uh-huh. What? Was a movie. Yeah. So, so if you go on Google Earth and you look up an address, you can obviously – you can often right. see the house in the right, front. Right. And there was like, these guys that – they posed with a sign or something in front of their house just so they could get on Google Earth. Did it work? I think it did. Did it distort them so they're all weird looking? No, they were like there with their Because you know those panoramic cameras? You ever see that when yeah. Yeah, uh, if you drag uh, somebody's it too fast. right there and, it, and then they look all angular, their face look. Yeah. There was another one too where a husband, I think it was a husband or a wife, went on Google Earth just for fun, looked up their address. And then saw a strange car in the driveway. Oh no! You brought this up. You brought yeah. this up. The guy, the guy or the girl were cheating, right? Yeah, was, yeah. <laughs> so Whose car fun. is this, honey? Yeah, yeah, that yeah. would suck. Oh dude. You crap, up like that. bro! <laughs> hey, real quick, do you like soda but don't like the sugar? You want something that's healthy and good for your gut as well? Try Olipop. I'm not making this up. These are sodas designed to be good and healthy for your gut. 
and they're almost no sugar and very low calories. And the flavors are incredible, like strawberry, vanilla, orange, squeeze. Uh, they have cherry, vanilla. Uh, they also have, uh, what's the new one that they have? Tropical Punch. Tropical Punch. It's delicious. It tastes good. It's good for your gut. Low calories, almost no sugar. Go check them out. Go to mindpumppartners.com. Click on Olipop. And then if you use the code mindpump, you'll get a discount. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First question is from VIXD88. How do weighted dips compare to the bench press? Mm. Ah, that's actually a fair question. Obviously, two different exercises. Yeah. I would say, um, I mean, plainly- Both beneficial. Yeah, super beneficial. On, on its surface, uh, I would say more, probably more tricep um, activation in dips than maybe in the bench press. Uh, probably more chest activation in the bench press than in the deadlift. Um, I'm, excuse me, than in the uh, than dips. Um one is open chain and one's closed chain. So open chain meaning, you know, I'm moving the weight away from my body versus dips where I'm moving my body. Uh, but other than that, because there's, they're different movement patterns, uh, I think they, they definitely contribute to each other, but they're also different enough that you would definitely program them in the same workout. I oh, don't both, see them being trained. Yeah. Both yeah. belong in there, but yeah. also keep in mind too, when you're talking about, uh, you know, comparing the dips and a bench press to, you know, how are they the same or differ in relation to tricep or chest activation? You can manipulate that too. Yeah. So like if you're doing dips you and I want angle. more chest, I flare my elbows out, and right? Lean forward and lean right? forward. Yeah. So I lean, I let my body kind of lean and fall forward. I flare the elbows out. Now I get a lot more chest in there. Simply being more upright and bringing my elbows in, now I get a lot more tricep. Mm -hmm. Same thing goes for a bench press. If I'm doing a bench press and I want more tricep activation, then I tuck my elbows in and do like a close grip type of a bench mm -hmm. press. So there's a bit of a spectrum there, even though they're very different exercises. I think they both belong in in your your training yeah. regimen, but you can also manipulate the mechanics of it to activate more of one muscle than the and other. One complements the other. I really love the uh, the deep stretch you get out of uh, dips. <clears throat> yeah, uh, and you know it's it's really hard to get that type of range of motion, you know, just from the bench press. And so then that complements the bench press when, especially, you know, typically at the bottom where a sticking point, a lot of people have a hard time getting back up. Like you really focus in on the strength and and summoning the force to be able to take that towards the bench press. Yeah, the range of motion on dips is potentially massive. And I say potentially because you don't just go to your deepest range of motion that you don't control. You will hurt yourself. So you see a yeah. lot of people getting shoulder injuries from doing dips because they just go as low as they can. It has to still be under control, but the range of motion is greater than in a bench press. A bench press, you're limited by the bar. That's it. It hits That's your chest it. and you're down with dips. You can go down very deep. Now, one, one comment I have is that I think that I think dips are a bit underrated. I really do. Um, it definitely, when you compare them to pull-ups, like everybody agrees that pull-ups are so great for the upper body that they build the lats and the biceps and they're excellent. Dips don't get the same, they really don't get the same admiration and they should. Mm -hmm. It's such a phenomenal exercise. I think part of it is they're hard because it's body weight. So you're like, if you can't lift your body weight, I guess you can't do it. I mean, any there's a lot of ways to do it. Though. Any compound lift for the upper body should get more credit than it does. Yeah. I mean, yeah. just, just that in itself, there's not a lot of... But I mean, everybody benches, right? But right. not everybody does dips. Yeah, is no. the thing that I'm saying. I, I mean, I think to your point, I think it's I think it's challenging for That's people so they, so they don't do it. I, I'll never forget the first time I tried to do dip. I couldn't even do one body weight yeah. dip. Mm. And I remember being like, oh shit, can't even do that. Well, because your shoulders can almost be uh, a little bit more in a locked position. You don't have to have as much... Um, mobility and and um, things to consider in terms of like the function of the shoulder mm -hmm. to be able to pull off a bench press versus a dip. Yeah. So there's a lot more uh, involvement there. Even yeah. though we don't we don't talk about going to failure that often, doing dips to failure is a lot safer and easier than doing like a bench press. Oh for, yeah, you, you know? just let go. Yeah, you just drop yeah. out of it, and so. But you, I, can take I, you it know, to that point. one great way to do dips for most people because a bodyweight dip's kind of hard. Uh, a real full range of motion dip is is pretty. I wouldn't say it's as hard as a pull up, but it's definitely hard. Um, you can use a resistance band between the bars, put your knees on it or your feet. Yeah. So now you're doing assisted dips. And I'm going to tell you something right now. Assisted dips are amazing. They really, really are. In fact, I'll do assisted dips sometimes, not because I can't do body weight dips, but because I want to go light enough to isolate particular parts of the movement or to really emphasize the range of motion. Like I'll go deeper on an assisted dip than I'll feel comfortable doing with my body weight. And then, of course, you can weight them. I mean, you can get really strong with weighted dips to a point where you're, you've are you got 
a hundred or 150 pounds strapped around your waist. And let me tell you, the strength that you get from dips will carry over to almost any press. I notice when my dips go up, mm -hmm. my even my incline goes up, my flat goes up. Even the overhead press. Even my overhead press goes yeah. up. Bottom line is if you're missing one of these movements, then you've got to get it programmed. Totally. I'm too too good, too totally. valuable. Also a good isometric exercise. Get at the top of a dip, parallel dip bars it out. with heavy weight yep. strapped between your legs and just hold on for 30 seconds. Yeah. Or at the bottom. Or at mm -hmm. the bottom. Both yep. those. Next question is from the next question is from is <laughs> wow. diet soda. You the system. You Someone's been, the somebody's <laughs> been listening to Mind Pump for a while. <laughs> That's good. Is diet soda really so bad for you? I love, you know why I, <laughs> I, really I, I picked this? There's a controversy Should around call Lane right now? artificial yeah. sweeteners and stuff. And so, okay, we pretty much unanimously agree here that diet sodas or, or artificial sweeteners aren't really a good idea for health. But it's not because the artificial sweetener technically is inherently unhealthy. There's lots of studies have been done on artificial sweeteners. They've been around for a while. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not going to say it's conclusive because I know how long-term studies can sometimes show effects later on down the line. So I'm not fully, fully convinced. But if I had to bet money, I would bet money that they're probably inherently safe because the studies are pretty unanimous and they show that. However, Diet sodas and diet foods with these artificial sweeteners, they do encourage behaviors that don't that don't seem to help with health. In fact, when you look at studies on diet sodas, except for the controlled ones where they tell people eat this many calories and then cut out your sugar and replace with artificial sweeteners, in which case we see weight loss. But in other studies where people consume a lot of diet sodas or choose on their own to replace diet so, uh, regular sodas with diet sodas, we don't see weight loss. We see that there's no effect. What I is going on? I right? feel like if yeah. you are somebody who uh, consistently tracks your food and calories, totally. diet sodas have uh, are, are a great tool and resource. I think if you're someone who does not track and your goal is to do use weight loss, I think diet sodas are, are a bad strategy. Mm -hmm. that, that that to me, it's that clear because and it's the behavior effect. That's what I mean. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. we know what it does behaviorally for a lot of people that are not really paying attention or counting that you drink that one diet soda has zero calories, but then you end up eating more of something else because you're not paying attention. But if you were like a competitor or just somebody who tracks their food consistently and you know how many calories you're consuming yeah. and you stick to your, your, your macros and you have a diet soda occasionally in there, I think there's nothing wrong yeah. with it. I've but never had a client except for the ones that were really meticulous about tracking. Yeah, competitors. I've Exactly. I've never had a client say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to just having start having diet foods. I've never seen it translate into effective uh, fat loss. There's three reasons for this, I believe, and I, I feel pretty strongly about this. One is foods with calories, there's an inherent obstacle, an inherent block there. I know that if I grab a, a Coke or a Pepsi, that I'm going to have 120 or 200 calories. When I grab a diet soda, that that inherent block, that thing that makes me pay attention is gone. And so people just go crazy with them, which leads me to the second point, which is although the artificial sweeteners have no calories and studies seem to show that they don't have an effect on insulin, maybe an effect or not on the gut microbiome, we're not too sure about this. There's still the sensation of sweet. There's still the perception of sweet. Does that have an effect on you? Of course it does. Otherwise, you wouldn't feel the sensation. What is one of the effects of the sensation or the perception of sweetness? Other foods start to taste less sweet. That's Artificial right. sweeteners are very powerfully sweet, like thousands of times or hundreds of times more powerful than even sugar. In fact, if you regularly consume diet sodas, you'll stop liking regular sodas. Well, don't it, taste yeah, as good. It'll change your relationship with vegetables and fruit. Mm -hmm. Bottom line, if mm -hmm. you drink diet sodas all the time, it will change your relationship. Now, that may not matter. You may still be fine. You may be able to still hit your macros, but I'll tell you right now, if you consistently drink artificial sweeteners and you have fruit and vegetables, it will taste different. You cut that out and you clean it out, all artificial sweeteners, and then go back to fruit and vegetables, they will taste different. Yes. I'm, and still, I'm still skeptical at the end of the day. Uh, I think there is a hierarchy of artificial sweeteners, too, to consider. And uh, I was just listening uh, to this podcast about, um, you know, uh, petroleum being the base of a lot of these uh, artificial sweeteners back in the day, and that was promoted a lot. And it's like, what, <laughs> like, at, at what point... Um, you know, are these chemicals inert, you know, uh, uh, that you're putting in your body? Uh, and so I just, it, to me, I would, I'd prefer to, to follow, uh, something that derived from a plant, 
uh, as opposed to something. So th there would like be Savio. sort of a, I would decipher between that in terms of how I would choose, like, uh, say, an artificial well, I, I, sweetener. Okay, and here's the thing, that we, what Justin's saying, because I know some people are like, well, the data shows, the, the double-blind placebo control you know, studies show. Okay, here's why I err on the side of what Justin is saying, because when we have a lot of time, when we're analyzing lots and lots and lots of data and anecdotes over years and years and years, what often happens is we go back and go, that thing that we said 70 years ago, <laughs> Ugh, you know, it seemed we might have been off on this. Now, when it comes to natural things, because we co-evolved with our environment, that tends to not be the case because because our bodies co-evolved with these things that have existed with us for well for a long time. Like eating things that may create the sensation of sweetness that doesn't have necessarily a lot of calories, like monk fruit or stevia. Like that's from a plant. How long have plants been on Earth? How long have we been consuming plants? A lot longer than we've been consuming. Artificial sweet. So that's why I err, err on, you know, what you're saying. Right. Uh, is that. And again, the sensation or the perception of sweetness is is not inert. You are you are perceiving something, and from a psychological level, there are effects. Obviously, otherwise you wouldn't consume this particular sweet thing, which means leads me to the third point, which is this. When you're developing a, a, a trying to develop a good relationship with food, constantly feeding a craving or distracting yourself with the sensation of sweet doesn't necessarily address the root cause of why you need to do that in the first place. So that's, and that's the, those are the three main reasons why I've never used, only competitors are the only people I've ever used it with because they try, it's, it's unhealthy to begin with. Everything's so tracked and perfect and whatever, and you're in pre-contest, in which case I'm like, yeah, okay, you can have your diet, so it's not going to give you any calories. Well, to that point too, I think there's a hierarchy of things that you should be worried about too. Like if, if, if you go through the McDonald's drive through every day and you order, you know, a number one supersize and then you have a Diet Coke, I think that's comical. Yeah. You know, it's like that. I mean, there's other things that potentially if you have terrible sleep all the time and, you know, you, you're you you're constantly stressed and you're, you're and then now you're on top of that, yeah. you're stressing out whether I should have a diet soda or not. Like you got it all backwards here. There's yeah. there's much bigger rocks than, you know, should I or should I not drink mm -hmm. diet sodas? And I, I would focus more on those things. And then you can get to the more nuanced things as you as you start to dial in everything else yeah. and go like, hey, you know, maybe I should drink less of this. It's not ideal for me. But if you're doing so many other things that are so much worse than that, it's not going to be the diet soda that yeah, kills yeah. you. Next question is from 24 IR Mays. When starting TRT, what are best practices to maximize response? Diet, sleep, workouts, et cetera? Yeah. Did you pick this out? I did. I'm so glad you picked this because I've actually got this in my DMs quite a few times from people. And it's it's kind of funny to me because I think it's the 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 backwards. I, I think you should try and optimize yeah, all the- first, then consider. Yeah, I had, I had yeah. several people like, hey, I'm going to start TRT, this and that. I was wondering if I should focus on this. And I'm like, well, uh, you should have focused on all that stuff first to see what you can do naturally to get your body as optimal as possible. Yeah. Then if you still are having a hard time getting your hormone levels optimal, and then you take something like testosterone, then you, you should already have been doing all those things. And then that's just going to enhance and make it better. Well, yeah, that was me. I mean, when I got tested and I was low, I had everything. I was dialed in on everything. So at which point I said, okay, okay, well, this might be something I have to do. But it, really, you know, here's the thing. A lot of people make this mistake. They think because their hormones are now in what would be considered more of an optimal range, meaning they no longer have symptoms of low testosterone or imbalanced hormones, it's in the upper normal range because hormone therapy isn't going to take you to bodybuilder levels or, you know, illegal athlete levels, but rather feel good, stay within a particular range, and they test lots of other things to make sure that your health improves, which in many cases does. If you go from low testosterone to a more optimal level, you'll see improvements in many of your, your blood markers. But nonetheless, people, what people tend to do is they think, oh, now this means I need to double the volume of my training. Oh, now this means I need to eat more right. because I'm... Whatever whatever is going to make optimize your health now will is the same stuff that's going to optimize your health when you're on uh, testosterone yeah. or, or or any other hormone exogenous hormone to balance them out. That's a fact. So, because a lot of people make this mistake, I've seen people DM me too. They've gone to our site, which is uh, mphormones.com and you could get like an assessment and do the whole thing and work with doctors. And then what they'll tell me is they'll say, hey, I've been doing MAPS anabolic. Yeah, should I ramp and up the been, volume? Yeah, it's been working really <laughs> great for me. Should I switch to MAPS PED or split? Like, no, it yeah. doesn't. It's not, that's not how it works. Yeah. What you'll do is you'll overtrain and negate some of the potential health effects that you could be getting from your testosterone. So, yeah. What you want to do is whatever makes you healthy 
yeah. naturally is also what's going to make you healthy when you're on hormone replacement therapy. And I would recommend that you try and get that stuff all balanced out first before you even get on HRT. I mean, totally. the idea is that maybe there might be one of those things that's causing you to have lower testosterone levels. And if you, I mean, if you haven't addressed that first, why wouldn't you address it's, that before doing it? It's like it? getting crappy sleep and then being like, what's the best caffeine yeah. to take to make myself feel better? Right, and that's right. what you're worried it's about. totally like it because it'll keep you going and you'll keep doing the workouts. Right. But if you're not addressing all those things, you're not going to be overall healthy, you know, holistically, you're yeah, just yeah. going to, you know, sort of fix like a part of the problem that just, um, you know, may, may not actually be like benefiting you like you think. Yeah. Right. Now I do want to also make this comment on this because this is becoming much more common. Um, and we have a lot of listeners now that have gone through our link because we, you know, we've basically picked who we think to be the best doctors for this, but I've, I've gotten questions on, you know, dosing and how do I know what's right or whatever. This is, there's a range that you go off of. And by the way, these ranges are dramatic. It's like 280 to 1100 sometimes, which is like, well, how do I know where I would fall and what would be best? Is it always best to be up here or what? It's both your the range, but also your subjective how feeling. How you feel. Yes, because some people feel better with in the higher range. Other people don't feel good in the higher range. So I've had people say, well, I had to lower my dose because I didn't feel as good or I was holding too much water or, you know, I wasn't noticing my, I, I noticed my mood got a little bit different or whatever. So they dropped the dose down. Then other people feel better when it's higher. And what you do is you want to go to doctors that are not afraid to adjust dosages also off of how you feel. Because if you just go off the chart, that doesn't tell the whole story. Well, imagine if, imagine if I had levels like Doug for most of my twenties or Doug's like thousand over a thousand, right? And uh, now I'm at, you know, I, the last time I got tested, I was around, well, let's just say I was much lower than this, but let's say I was 500, which I wasn't, I was much lower, but I was at 500, but still feel bad. Well, if my body is used to a thousand plus yeah. and it's 50% less now, I'm not going to feel as good as I did when I was on there, most right. likely not. So you, and, and if you were to go to a general practitioner just five years ago and they see that I'm at four or 500, oh, you're in the healthy normal range and yeah. they would just discount Dude. any of the side effects or things that I'm complaining so about. I felt, I, I felt, I, I feel better with it being higher because I've adjusted mine and I feel better up at a certain high range. My blood number, all my, my metrics improved. My cholesterol numbers improved, which often, sometimes testosterone makes cholesterol maybe go a little bit in the, in the wrong direction. Improved for me, although it was great before, is even better now. My, my blood cell count got better. Like everything improved. That's how I know plus my subjective feelings. So pay attention to that because it's it's much more nuanced than than you might think. Isn't uh, is is it Dr. Todd or Rant who's speaking next? In, by the Dr. way, we have a, a free Todd. forum. I had to tell someone the other day that in our our other forum cuz I know we charge for our private forum, the Mind Pump private forum, but we have a Mind Pump Hormones forum that is free. And and what and I don't know how long we'll keep it free cuz it's starting to fill up really fast. And I know that both Dr. Rant and Todd, they come in there twice a month and answer live questions. And then in addition to that, they're in there throughout the entire month answering as much as they mm -hmm. can in that form. There's tremendous value for anybody who's concerned or curious or want to know about all this stuff. And they're way more qualified to answer your questions than we are. Next question is from Jada Rankin. How has social media changed the health and fitness space for better Ooh, or for worse? Yeah. Ooh, you know, I think worse. I, well, so I had to think about it because <laughs> my initial reaction is that, right? Mm -hmm. Because you, you see a lot of crap. Well, we wouldn't exist if it wasn't for that. Well, that's thing. Level, so. well dude, I tell you what, I'm telling you guys right now, go to gyms, talk to people. I, you, I have seen more women lift weights, lift weights heavy. I've seen more barbell exercises and dumbbell exercises done properly today than ever. And I've seen more people ask better questions in regards to nutrition and health than I did 20 years ago or when, when I was, you know, training in gyms. I mean, you guys remember that we started in gyms. I mean, we, and we worked in big box gyms. Do you remember what it looked like in the weight area? It was, first of all, there were no, nobody was deadlifting or squatting men or women mm -hmm. and women were rarely ever in there. Now it's, I mean, I go to club sport, which is like a, it's like a, you know, like a middle of the road, you know, nice kind of place that, you know, no bodybuilders work out there or anything like that. And I'm watching people work out and there's always people doing terrible stuff. 
but it's way better than it was before. No, I agree with that. But then you could also counter that with, you know, anxiety, depression, suicide, obesity, all those things. Well, that's are not the all... health and fitness space. That's in general. I mean, it's still, I, I it's still, you. still part of that, you know, yeah. and, and, and eating disorders, uh, there's just as many eating disorders as there were before, if not more. I think some that's of the, a good, that's a good I think point. the people that are on the covers of magazines, most of them have eating disorders. So yeah, it's hard to say. Maybe it's a net zero. You know, maybe yeah. uh, it has got more people uh, working out. Maybe it's got more uh, women squatting and deadlifting and doing movements they should be I doing. Think it's, I think it's parallel to the internet. Like, are people smarter uh, from the internet's creation? <laughs> uh, because we have ac more access. Yeah. You know, the information's there. But yeah. I feel like there's so much now. And the, the biggest key is, like, how do you filter it? How do you navigate through it where do you find your content because there's still yeah like massively ridiculous well, people you know out there it's promoting a, bullshit it's a fire hose meaning there's more of everything there's more there's more of everything there's yeah. more good information more bad information there's just more of everything there's the the barriers to enter into the market of information is way lower yeah. which means good people like us could step in and do it. We could never have done this uh, before the internet and podcasting, never. Yeah. Uh, but it also means there's a low barrier for other people to enter into the space who suck yeah. or whatever. I know uh, Arthur Brooks talked about why social media is such a poor replacement for real contact, human contact. And he said, you get the dopamine release that you normally do. So if I meet Justin in person versus online and we're talking either time, dopamine's the same. But the difference is I only get oxytocin in person. That's the bonding, love, like feel good chemical. You don't get that through social media. And what's happened, and he made a good point of this, is people have sub substituted real in life interactions with, with internet and social media interactions because they still get the dopamine, but then they're depressed and anxious. They don't know why. They're lacking the other stuff that, that follows. Yeah. Hmm. It's, like you're, it's like you're breathing uh, something, but it's not oxygen. I mean, it could, be yeah. a, it could be an incredible tool. And we've said this before. It's a tool. So it, it can actually be great for someone who's willing to do the work, filter through all the yeah. noise, and find the good content, the good information. It could be life-changing for them. Yep. Somebody who's lazy and doesn't want to do that and just has got a short attention span and will click on the first TikTok video that grabs their attention and then go down the rabbit hole and then start following whoever's telling them random advice, it could be more dangerous. So it just it really depends on the end consumer on how valuable or how dangerous social media has become to the health and fitness and space. Yeah, and so on the positive side, I think um, coaches now that have you know have had very limited reach, you know that the yeah. very qualified, awesome, educated coaches, like if they focus on it, they can really expand. Um, their their reach and be able to 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 get their message and their education out so much more effectively now. Uh, we just we need to just rally them to to be motivated to do that. Yeah, you know? trainers seem to be smarter in general than they were twenty yeah. years ago. I think there's a long way to go with the, the average trainer. That's why I'm always like, don't be. Don't be like paralyzed by the fact that there's like competition out there. Like yeah. we need more, like way more than you would think uh, yeah. to to be able to combat the the poor information. Well, I remember before we started this, that was one of the conversations that we had at my house, and we talked about wanting to highlight other great minds because yeah. at that time we we would we would name drop people that have impacted us that were brilliant minds in the space and most people wouldn't know who that name was yep. unless you had read their book. You probably didn't know because they weren't popular on social media. So I know part of the mission of doing this was to get to a place where we have that much pull that we can highlight somebody on here. I mean, so cool. I was just talking to Jordan shallow two days ago and where was he at? He was somewhere in the other side it of the was world. Somewhere in the Middle East, wasn't he? Yeah, he's somewhere in the Middle East. And he was just, he was sending a really nice text message to me, just thanking us. And like, dude, he, he goes, blows my mind. Doesn't matter where, what corner of the world I'm in. It's like almost everybody that knows of me. He's is, in like Qatar. So yeah, it was, some, it was yeah. crazy, right? And he's yeah. like, He's like, come running up to me like, oh, I found you on Mind Pump. So, huh. I mean, so I, you know, I do feel good that we're, we're able to do something like that and get someone like that's pre presenting such valuable information like him. Um, we wouldn't have been able to do that if it wasn't for, you know, social media. Yeah, when I take a, like, like when I get myself out of it, because I think sometimes when you're in it, especially if you're start to get focused on the negative stuff, you can start. So I, so yeah, if you I can see I, it everywhere. When yeah. While you guys were talking, focused. I'm like, let me try and like go 40,000 feet up in the air and, you know, from the outside of it and look down and. I fundamentally believe that if information is available and if speech is free, that ultimately uh, we will eventually the truth and the right and the good 
information will win out eventually. Yep. But what that also what I also acknowledge is on the way there, there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of mistakes and a lot of learning <laughs> yeah. and a lot of problems. But I do think ultimately, you know, the way you beat bad information or incorrect information is with truth and good information. You just have to beat it out you by put, you just put them right next to each other. Yes. And then people can finally see it. Yes. But you know, on the way there, there's a lot of crap yeah. that we got we gotta end up dealing with. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find us on social media. Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. Adam is on Instagram at mindpumpadam. And you can find me on Twitter at mindpumpsal. 